Hi, this is David Amonic Turtle continuing with CFA Level 1 Review Financial Statement Analysis and specifically Ratio Analysis. This is the third video in ratios. I've previously looked at activity ratios, most recently liquidity ratios, where I tried to emphasize a difference here between liquidity and solvency. Liquidity is focused on the short term, typically a question of do we have enough cash to get through in the short term, as opposed to these here ratios, solvency, which are primarily focused on the long term and then are divided into two broad categories, debt ratios that focus on the balance sheet and measure the amount of debt capital relative to equity capital. And then there's some redundancy in these measures. We don't use them all. We don't need them all. As opposed to the coverage ratios that introduce the income statement and measure the ability of a company to cover its debt payments. Okay, so if we take just a, a hypothetical ABC Corp and then just pull out some aggregated major line, line items here or account balances, summary account balances, year end 2010 up and then year end one year later at 2011. Keep in mind these are year end point in time account balances, equity reserves, total financial debt liabilities, the sum of those being total assets. And so while some definitions will vary in the CFA, what's important is that total debt is the sum of interest-bearing short-term and long-term debt. And so it would not include equity. It would not include other reserves here. This term has a few definitions, but here I'm just defining it as either a contra-asset account or more likely a liability account that's not really an explicit source of financial capital. And then other liabilities. Okay, so the sum of those is total assets. And if that's a little difficult here, I just pull the same numbers into a stylized balance sheet. And here we know on the left-hand side needs to equal the right-hand side. Or really, more specifically, equity is what's left over after we take assets and subtract all of the liabilities. And so in this case, we can have current liabilities, for example, of 6000 and so a good example of this is accounts payable. Now accounts payable is a source of cash when we look at the cash flow statement, but it's not an explicit source of funding. So it's not like a bank came in and lended us the accounts payable amount. This is not, it does not get included in total debt. And then reserves would be other liabilities, maybe representing some contingent liabilities or provisions set aside, not sources of financial capital. What the explicit sources of financial capital are the debt and the equity. Another way to think about this is it's the lenders and the shareholders coming together. And so what, what is this primarily? It's primarily bonds or loans. Okay, so we'll keep that in mind as we look at these first uh, three or four ratios that have a lot in common in the sense that they're all balance sheet accounts. And then the, for these first three, it's total debt in the numerator. So we have debt to assets here with the ABC Corp, which would be 3,000 divided by the total assets of the left-hand side of the balance sheet of 17,700, giving us a debt to assets of a ratio of 16.9%. As is usually the case, difficult to analyze in isolation. So we typically either do benchmark to peers or really benchmark to its own history. So in this case, we look back and we notice that that rate, uh, debt to assets ratio has dropped and we can say that that indicates that the debt has declined and the solvency has improved. This would be one metric that just in isolation we'd say the solvency is improved as the debt to asset ratio has come down. Debt to capital, notice again, balance sheet on balance sheet, total debt again in the numerator, but this time we're comparing it to capital. And so in the case of uh, ABC Corp, it's 3,000 debt and equity of 5,500. So we're going to take the three and divide it into 8,500, the sum of debt plus equity. And so we get a debt to capital of 35.3. And we can compare that. What's the trend? Well, similarly, it's coming down and it indicates that the debt has declined and the solvency has improved. And then debt to equity. So this time, notice we just have equity in the denominator. And in this case, 3,000 would go into 5,500 and give us a higher absolute number of 54.5. But relative to the previous year, it's coming down. 
And so we can make a similar statement that the solvency has improved. Now, that's no accident. I said there's redundancy. So this debt to equity is redundant with the debt to capital. We don't need them both. There may be a more elegant way to express it, but I just, if I take debt to capital, I can use that to solve for debt to equity. And you can see here, there's a direct relationship between debt to equity and debt to capital, so they're redundant. We only really need one of them. And just to show that, we had a debt to capital of 35.3. I take the reciprocal of that, minus one, reciprocal of that quantity, and I get the debt to equity. Okay, the last debt ratio is actually very common. So it's the financial leverage ratio. And notice here we went to average total assets divided by average total equity. Remember those account balances are point in time, but as these most, most both fluctuate, assets and equity over the year, might make more sense to take an average of these accounts. So we have average total equity divided by average total assets. And in this case, we would get a financial leverage ratio of 3.54. So we just want to keep in mind that it's okay to express this leverage as equity over assets, but assets over equity means that the higher is the ratio, the more leveraged is the company. Or we could rephrase here, every $1 of equity is supported by $3.54 of assets. And then in terms of the coverage ratio, interest coverage ratio measures how easily a firm can pay its interest expense. So we'd have EBIT divided by interest payments, earnings before interest and tax divided by the company's interest payments. And for example, if EBIT is 2000 and the interest payments are 3000 we have an interest coverage of 6.67. And this indicates that the company is now in a better position to pay down its debt as it's an improvement from the interest coverage ratio of 4. More EBIT in order to cover the interest payments. And then finally, as this interest coverage ratio may not fully reflect the fixed charges, primarily because there may be operating leases, that are not capital leases and therefore won't be capitalized on the balance sheet, we can look at the fixed charge, which attempts to be more comprehensive and adds the lease payment into both the numerator and the denominator, but it otherwise is sim uh, similar. So we have EBIT plus the lease payments divided by interest plus the lease payments. It gives us a fixed coverage charge of 3.43. And so arguably we're a little more precise about the total fixed charges because we've now accounted, we've now treated the operating leases as fixed charges. And, but directionally we get the same result in the sense that the fixed charge ratio has improved. And so there's, that indicates a greater ability to service debt from the operating earnings. And so then here, just a summary of some of these ratios that we've come over, that we've reviewed. And keep in mind, these are all solvency ratios. And then we had here, these first four were debt ratios focused on the balance sheet. And these second two are coverage ratios, which invoke or involve the income statement. This is David of the Bionic Turtle. Thanks for your time.